بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهد أن لا إله إلا الله وشهد أن محمدا رسول الله We start in the name of Allah Rahman Rahim O oh, praise to Allah Rabbul Alameen And may the peace and blessings be upon Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Upon his family, upon his companions And upon all those who follow the path of Haqq, the path of truth Until the day of judgment And a do dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Insha'Allah that we are from those people Brothers, sisters, inshallah, jazakallah khair for, for the invitation. Uh, the subject which I've been asked to uh, talk about is the importance of providing Islamic education for our children. To be frankly very honest, I don't believe necessarily there needs to be a, a discussion about the importance of providing Islamic education for our children because that should be known to all of us. As Muslims, we have a very fundamental responsibility which is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the dunya by performing our actions according to a very clear criteria which is the halal and the haram whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obliged for us to perform that which is the fard whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has recommended for us to undertake which is the sunnah Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited for us to participate in, which is the haram, or disliked for us, which is the makruh, then we organize our life according to this. And part of that aspect and part of that responsibility naturally focuses upon providing the correct atmosphere, providing the correct education, providing the correct culture and values in which our children grow. And therefore, we always talk about this, isn't it? That at the best of times, it's very difficult to raise children. At the best of times. Um, I can speak from a personal basis, having seven children of my own is not a very easy thing to do. But this challenge to raise children becomes far more magnified when the society, the community, the place where we live, its values and its cultures are not in harmony with Islamic values and culture. It becomes that much more difficult to then raise our children. That becomes even more so when these values and culture dominate the society and they are alien to our Islamic culture and our values. And this challenge becomes even more greater when we now have a situation where there is some sort of siege mentality. That the Muslim community is the focus and the target upon its values, upon its identity, upon its culture. And this is the framework in which we need to have this discussion. And it should be very clear to all of us when Rasulullah in the hadith he talked about when he said يَأْتِ عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَان أَسَّابْرُ فِيهِمْ عَلَى دِينِهِ كَالْقَابِدِ عَلَى الْجَمَرِ That there will come a time, there will come a time upon the people when the one who is patient or the need to be patient from those holding on to their deen is like holding on to a hot coal of fire that holding on to Islam will be like holding on to hot coal of fire that's the reality in what we face today and this isn't purely living here in the western world wherever that may be but also this it becomes true also living in the Muslim world where the values and the culture slowly are eroding and try to identify the Islamic values is becoming a challenge even in the Muslim world. And within that framework, we talk about this responsibility. And let's be clear about this responsibility. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, in, said says, Bad bismillahir Rahim, Ya ayyuha ladina amanu sdaru, wa sabiru, wa rabitu, wa taqullah la allakum tuflihun. Oh, you believe, have patience. Be patient. Be steadfast. Rabitu. Be steadfast. Wattaqullah. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La'allakum tuflihun. And you will be the ones who will be successful. These are the times where we need to have patience and perseverance in the climate that we live in today in order to ensure we provide the correct framework in which to raise our children. So what I want to do, inshallah, for the rest of the discussion, is focused upon three main items. One is to understand the scope of this responsibility. 
Secondly, is to discuss the framework of how best we can manage this responsibility to provide an Islamic education. And third part is to give some consideration that we should have. And these considerations are something which are not set in stone. These are just observations. Because within Islam, there are certain ahkam where you can all of only follow it line by line, dot by dot. You follow the sequence. And there is no room to maneuver to the left or to the right. For example, salah, very clear. You follow the sequence, dot by dot, line by line, from the beginning until the end. From the time you make the niyyah to the end when you give your taslim, it's, 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 it is fixed. There's no way to escape either side. But there are certain rules where there is no straight line, there's just a perimeter. And the responsibility of the Muslim is to live within that perimeter. And the social system, managing our children, managing our relationships with our wives, with our parents, with our sons and daughters, falls within that framework of a perimeter. Where the aim is to live within this perimeter. This perimeter is the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are what is allowed, what is not allowed. That is the perimeter. But the aim is not to live on the perimeter. But that creates a very difficult situation. You come home, say to your wife, you must cook for me. And she looks at you and says, well, you must provide financial support for me. Okay, then you must wash the dishes. Okay, then you must take me out every single week to go shopping. That's literally living on the perimeter. I mean, these are Islamic rules. It's not much about married life. No, the aim is to live within the perimeter. And we look to this, that my relationship that I have with my parents may be somewhere over here within that perimeter. And that relationship with my parents, it may not be the same as yours. Your relationship could be somewhere down here. But nonetheless, it's within the perimeter. Why? Because as human beings, we have different strengths, different qualities. Some people are more emotional, others are not. Some people are more rational, some of them are not. There are things which we consider to be important, which, for example, our wives do not consider to be important. So, yeah, so when our parents come to visit, that is very, very important. But when our in-laws come to visit, that's not that important, is it? Of course it is. But you see, there are differences. And how we manage that is within that perimeter. There's no set line that you work on, because that would not be a relationship. That creates to disharmony. And managing our children is also within that framework. So there's no set solution. There are only things that we need to consider. And in that regard, in as much as a brother or a sister can give advice, equally as much yourself within the audience can also provide that sort of advice. What is a better way to provide the correct environment or the correct framework to give education and culture to our children. So let's start from the onset. The framework of, of this education. Effectively, I say there are four elements that we need to consider regarding our Islamic education. Take it for granted that we accept that it is our responsibility, our responsibility, to provide this education. The hadith of Rasulullah he said, uh, each one of you is responsible, each one of you is a shepherd for your responsibilities. So as a father, I am responsible to ensure that my child, my children get the correct education, get the correct culture. That's my responsibility. I cannot pass a responsibility on to somebody else. It is my responsibility. Maybe there are others, for example, the masajid, the local community, may Allah reward them all, that they put the effort in to provide a framework of an education. But ultimately, I am responsible to make sure that this education is correct, that my child is attending, that he is listening, he is learning, and he is growing within that framework. It is my responsibility. I cannot pass that on to somebody else. It's very, very important that we recognize that as a very fundamental concept. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَحْلِيكُمْ نَارًا وَقُدُوهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارًا O you who believe, protect yourself and your family from the hellfire. O you who believe, protect yourself, myself, yourself, and your family, your children from the hellfire. It is our responsibility. Fundamentally, we need to recognize that. So what is this framework? Inshallah, there are four aspects I want to discuss very, very briefly. One, that this education, however it is presented, 
wherever it is presented, it must build the foundation correctly. This foundation is what we call our Iman, our Aqidah. But we must establish it correctly and purely. And, and, and you may say, actually, well, isn't that obvious? We just say to our children, we must believe in Allah, we must believe in the Quran, we must believe in the angels, etc., etc. Isn't that what we mean by establishing their foundation correctly? These are the details. Establishing correctly means it must be established upon the correct basis. And what do we mean by the correct basis? Simple example, when I was young, and brothers, please don't be fooled, I'm so young, these white hairs are just imitations. I'm, I'm really still, I'm still within the frame of being young. But when I was younger, and at school, and growing up in the United Kingdom, once I was asked the question, uh, why are you Muslim? And I said, because I believe in Islam. And the question was, why do you believe in Islam? Because I believe that there is Allah. And the question was first to me, well, how do you know there's God? And suddenly, you know, I said, ah, no problem. I'm going to speak to my parents. I'll come back to you tomorrow. I go home to my parents. Mom, Dad. Wow, man, there's a real ignorant boy at my school. You know, he's trying to attack me, attack Islam, not acceptable. But he asked me a question, just need an answer, a very quick answer. You know, how do I know there's Allah? And my dad looked at me. Why are you asking me that question? Because dad, you taught me my deen. So clearly, you, you know, we believe and we need to know why we believe. So, alhamdulillah, how do I know there's Allah? And my dad became very angry. Don't ask these questions. And then I got confused. But then how do I answer this person? So, I, I take it, I, I, and I escalate the matter. You know, in business, if you can't resolve it, you do a process of escalation. So the process of escalation, where do I take it to? I go to my local masjid. Because if my father doesn't know, and I'll reward him for all of his efforts, then obviously I know a man who does. The Imam, MashaAllah, he absolutely definitely has his answer to this question. So I go to my local Imam of the Masjid. Imam Sab, uh, yeah, you know, at my little school, an ignorant boy asked me this question, and I just need a simple answer. You know, uh, and he, he was, MashaAllah, beta pucho. Son, ask. I said, um, yeah, I just need to know, how do I know that God exists? And he, you c I could just remember his face, he started to sweat, was looking around, he didn't know how to answer the question. We don't ask these kind of questions, we just believe. And that confused me. So the subject matter about establishing the correct foundation, isn't that our children know that Islam is the haq, Islam is the truth? Alhamdulillah, this is something that we establish for them. But rather the basis is established correctly is how they know it is the truth. Because this foundation is absolutely fundamental. When you want to build a house, you don't build a house on sand. Because you know no matter how beautiful the house is, how beautiful this, this, this breathtaking amount of investment to build these beautiful houses, if it's built on sand, the moment the wind comes, the house will just be blown away. We need to make sure that the foundation that the house has been established firmly, strongly, and correctly. That is our foundation. Our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and so forth. We have to establish it correctly. Point number one. Point number two, from this foundation, we need to ensure that our children develop the correct personality. And the personality has just two very simple parts to it. The way we think and the way we behave. That this must be established correctly. How we think. We must make the thinking according to this criteria of halal and haram. That's how we must think. That we only take what Islam has allowed us to take. And we leave what Islam has told us to leave. And we love what Islam has told us to love. And we hate what Allah has told us to hate. That is the thinking that we must establish within our children. And our behavior must be consistent with that thinking. Yeah. So we go to a local shop, convenience store, we're hungry, mashallah, and we know any one of those sandwiches in the refrigerator will 
satisfy our hunger. There is a tuna sandwich. I mean, I'm, just bear with me. I mean, I'm from the UK. I don't know what, what kind of food you guys have. Tuna sandwich. There's a, a bacon sandwich and there's a, a cheese burger or something. Which one are you going to go for? Obviously, we know we won't choose a ham sandwich. We won't choose a cheeseburger if it's not halal. But we'll take the tuna sandwich, although I don't eat tuna. But there you go. You, you just realize, you know, we built a mentality that our thinking is what is halal and haram is matched by our behavior of what is halal and haram. That personality needs to be established. And we need to think what are the ways to establish that personality correctly. That there needs to be an environment in which our children grow, where that personality also grows in light of these parameters that we have. How do we do that within the framework of a community that lives in a society where the values and the culture are not Islamic? And our children go to school and they're exposed to a culture and values which are not Islamic. And they live amongst friends that may be Muslims who don't adopt that Islamic thinking. They don't behave in an Islamic way. Our daughters have friends, mashallah, who are not covered Islamically. And then we think, how do we manage that? And that is the reality in which we're trying to build an Islamic personality for our children. It's a challenge for us. Third element, we need to build the correct perspective for our children. What is this correct perspective? That Islam isn't about the month of Ramadan. Islam isn't about the Friday prayers. Islam isn't about obedience to parents. Islam isn't about praying and fasting and zakat and hajj or what we call the five pillars. Rather, these are all parts of Islam. The perspective our children must learn that Islam is an indivisible whole. That our whole life is governed by Islam. That in as much that we make our children learn the rules of prayer, they must learn the rules of fasting, they must learn the rules of etiquette, they must learn the rules of marriage, they must rule, learn the rules of business contracts, they must learn the rules related to how we manage a society. They need to know what Islam is, that Islam is beyond the masjid. Islam cannot be contained within the masjid. It is beyond the masjid. The month of Ramadan, Quran was revealed in the month of Ramadan, but the Quran came not for the month of Ramadan. It came for our entire life to govern every aspect of our life. Our youth must gain that correct perspective about what Islam is. And number two, they must gain the correct perspective regarding what their identity is. That their, that their identity is connected to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this identity connects them and bonds them to a Muslim, wherever that Muslim is. That yes, I may have been born in America, and I may have the American citizenship. I may have been born in the, in the United Kingdom and have the British citizenship. But I'm so connected, connected to the Muslim who was born in Palestine. I'm so connected to the Muslim who was born and lives in Syria. I'm so connected to the Muslim who was born and lives in Burma, or lives in Somalia, or lives in Egypt, or lives in Bangladesh. Why? Because the Muslim Ummah is one Ummah. And we don't differentiate by nationality. A Muslim Ummah is wahada min dunin nas. The Muslim Ummah is one Ummah, unique, to the exception of all others. Our children must grow within that mentality and that personality and that perspective that we are connected to the Muslims wherever they are. Their problems are our problems. Their happiness is our happiness. Their suffering is our suffering. Their loss is our loss. That perspective needs to be given to our children as part of this education. And the final part of this education is the concept of responsibility. That our children must understand that this responsibility for Islam doesn't lie with the elder generation. It lies with everyone who has declared the shahada. That this responsibility doesn't lie when I become a teen or when the first specks of hair start to grow and I 
uh, and you know it grows the moment you realize that responsibility and that this responsibility encompasses myself and what I need to do but it also encompasses my family that responsibility also encompasses my community but that responsibility also encompasses my ummah and they need to have the understanding of that responsibility is beyond the individual is beyond the family is beyond the community is beyond the society it is on the level of us as an ummah they must recognize that responsibility so in summary this point about Islamic education and these four perspectives it must be built upon the correct foundation it must be there to establish the correct personality it must be built within the correct <coughs> perspective it must generate the correct responsibility so any education that we seek to provide it must be built within those four parameters it's essential my aim wasn't to define this in terms of that means you must give half an hour of the Jewish, you must give one hour of Hifz of Quran, you must give one hour about Islamic history, you give one hour regarding the seerah of Rasulullah. That is a curriculum. My point is whatever curriculum that we provide must be geared towards achieving these four aims. That is what is critical. Now, the last part I wanted to talk about was considerations, practical considerations, what we need to have in terms of our children. And I've listed six. Number one, to be successful in providing Islamic education to our children, the most important thing is to be an example yourself. It doesn't make sense as a father. I, I sit at home and, you know, I know, I, I know here you have American football is a, a major thing. But in the UK, we, soccer is a, is a very big thing in the UK. It's not the case. It can't be right. I'm sitting down watching TV and I say to my son, Abdullah, yalla, go quickly. Go and do wudu, it's time for salah. Abdullah, mashallah, very obedient, runs upstairs, does wudu, comes running downstairs, Baba, ana jahiz, I'm ready. I'm ready, come on, let's go. And he says, oh, no, no, hold on, I just, gotta, just wanna see this. Oh man, but he missed the goal. Just give me five minutes, give me five minutes, inshallah, I wanna see what else is gonna happen. We've sent the wrong signal to our son, automatically. You said to him, salah is so important, but not as important as I have to watch the end of this football game, the soccer game. We need to be an example. It makes no sense for me as a mother saying to my daughter, you've got to cover up. But I just don't do that myself. It's imperative we recognize that responsibility. We need to be an example. And this example means we demonstrate the importance of Islam. When I was young, when I used to come home to school, home, come home from school, what were the questions that I'd be asked by my father? Number one, did you get into trouble? Baba, no, I didn't get into trouble. Question number two, do you have any homework? Baba, yes, I do. So, conclusion, get changed, have dinner, do your homework, go to bed. That was the best conversation I had between Monday and Friday, same conversation. Monday to Friday, that's what I got. Every single day. Did you get into trouble? No. Have you got homework to do? Yes. Go up, says, get changed, come down, have dinner, do your homework, go to bed. Yeah. We're not setting the right example. Really, if we think about it, it's the son comes home. It's what I used to do with, with my kids. Son comes home, first question, Abdullah, did you pray? Baba, yes, I did. Did you pray, did you pray in Jamaat? Uh, actually, no, I didn't. Why didn't you pray in Jamaat? Do you know the reward of praying in Jamaat? Come on. Yeah, I was, I was struggling because I was between lessons and I didn't have much time. And then the discussion, well, have you tried to talk to your teachers about arranging a facility so you guys can pray? Uh, we're trying. Do you want me to come into the school and discuss? You're showing him that focus. Number two, did you get into trouble? No. Why didn't you get into trouble? What's going on? You mean you didn't talk to anybody? I mean, I'm disappointed in you. Baba, I tried, but the teacher didn't want to talk to me. That's not good. Tomorrow, make sure you have, a, have that debate. Yeah. Baba, okay. And then, do you have any homework? Yes. Okay. Go upstairs, get changed, come down for dinner, and do that. Do you see? It's different. That mentality is different. Just adding those two steps at the beginning change the framework of how our children understand what is and what is not important. That's not to say education is not important. 
you know, I ended up with a degree, ended up with a master's. Uh, that isn't the case. It's what we build as a mentality within our children, what is important, what is not important. Yeah. Being an example is critical. Being an example is fundamental. Because naturally, when kids grow up, their role models are who? <coughs> their parents. So we have to be that role model. It's very, very important. Number two, consideration. We must constantly be in communication with our children. Constantly. It's very, very important. Constantly in communication, discussing all the time with our children. We shouldn't be the absent parent that only turns up at the dinner table. That only turns up to scream and say, why are you still shouting? You should, the, the lights are off, you should be sleeping by now. You know, no, it's, it's constant communication. And I give practical examples. I, you know, I'm, I'm currently based in the Middle East at the moment. When I go shopping with my daughter, always constantly we're talking. You know, daughter, her name is Noura. Noura, you see that sister over there? You see she's not covered? What do you think? Ah, uh, Baba, this is wrong. Why is it wrong? And we have that discussion. And then my daughter goes, Shall I go and talk to her, Baba? I want to sort her out. No, 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 no. Just want you to understand that, you know, we do, as Muslims, this is a big problem. And then I say, Why do you think this is a problem? She goes, Because she's jahil. Okay, if you think so. But we're living in a Muslim country. How come she's not dressed according to Islam? Uh, her parents are very bad. Uh, maybe, but the parents only talk to what they knew themselves. Who's responsible? Baba, I don't know. But you see, we have the constant discussion, constantly, at the dinner table, with, with my children. You know, and I said, did anybody watch the news today? And my, and my youngest, yeah, Baba, I did. Uh, and, and, and what did you see in the news? There was a woman talking. All right, very good, mashallah. So clearly he was watching the news. And it's true, he, he saw a woman talking. Okay, then, Adish, anybody else? <laughs> and then we have the discussion. Yeah, you know, the other day there was, a, you know, the, there was a, two Russian jets that were taken down by, by the Turkish army. Wow, subhanAllah. Is, is, is that important? Yes, why is it important? And we start having that discussion, communication. And through this communication, what we're doing what we're doing, we're building thinking within our children. Not only just we're building thinking within our children, we're understanding what our children are thinking about. When my child comes home to school, from school, I always ask, and what did you do today? What did you study? Biology, and what did you learn in biology? Oh, we were learned about evolution. Evolution. And what did they talk about? Oh, that we came from monkeys and apes. Wow, what do you think? And we start having that discussion. And it's amazing. What you learn and what you pick up from your children by communicating with them. We must be in constant communication with our children because that is the only way to understand what our children are thinking about and how to influence their thinking in the right direction. Constant communication, 24-7, whenever the opportunity comes, take the opportunity to discuss with them. You'd be surprised what we learn, what we pick up from our children, what they talk about, what happens at school that we don't know about. One son, he came home from school, he said to his father, Baba, we learned about penguins today. Oh, really? Penguins? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the names was Jack and John. Penguins were Jack and John. Yeah, 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 and they were friends. They were friends. And then the father picked up very, very quickly that this lesson was about how it was okay for people of the same sex who have a relationship. And the way they want to introduce this by two characters, penguins, that they have a relationship. And both are, one is Jack, one is John. And that's acceptable. And the father would not have known this unless he just asked the question. What did you learn at school today? And this is what we're learning. It's amazing. Small things, but they have a huge significance. So constant communication is, is imperative. Third thing. Nafsiya. Nafsiya is the, the what's the best way to describe nafsiya? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's like, say, how, how do we best describe disposition then? <laughs> MashaAllah. <laughs> and how do we best describe inclination? Nafsiya is about, in a simple way without losing it, is um, how we develop a like for something. And the point here is that we need to develop this like from the earliest age. 
from the earliest age. So for example, even when, when, the, when, the, when the baby is born and you tuck him into bed, you put the Qur'an in the background. So the child becomes familiar of the sound of the Qur'an, the recitation of the Qur'an, constantly. How often do we do this with our children at night time? You put on the Qur'an, so they're listening to the Qur'an. Because normally what tends to happen, that the first thing you wake up, the first thing you remember is what you were doing last night. And the Qur'an is a beautiful thing to fall, to, to fall asleep with. It's very small, but it has a huge significant impact. Uh, a good e example, my, my daughter, when she was growing up, and you know, mashallah, I have six boys and, and, and just the one daughter, and mashallah, she's more of a man than her six brothers, but uh, that's a different story. And while she was growing up, from a very young age, we used to put the khimar upon her, the, the head cover, from a very young age. From about three months on, we put the khimar upon her. And what she would do, she would take it off, she would put it in her mouth, she would throw it away. Uh, but every so often, we would put it back upon her. And it was a game, yeah, that she would become comfortable wearing the khimar. It becomes part of her. Yeah. So this behavior from a very early age, this desire, this inclination towards it, now subhanAllah, she's now 13, she goes to sleep in it. She doesn't take it off. And we sit there and we joke with her. We say, where well, are you mahram? For heaven's sake, what's wrong with you? Baba, I just like it. And we, and we say to her, you know, we'll feel sorry for your husband, you know, imagine that, you know, I'm not taking it off, don't you touch me, you know. But the reality of what we're building is that inclination, that love. It's very important that we build that inclination from a very, very young age. Very, very young age, so it grows. That love grows. For example, when we pray, when we come to the mosque, we should always bring our children with us to the masajid. And along the masajid, we make it a journey for them. And we give them some sort of responsibility in the masjid or coming to the masjid for to do things. So their love for them to come to the masjid becomes natural for them. That they always want to go to the masjid. And they feel uneasy if they don't, if they don't go to the masjid one day, Baba, I didn't go to the masjid, I feel really bad, I need to go. I need to go. You know, in our household, mashallah, for the last seven years, you know, we fast on Mondays and Thursdays. Now, if I go to a home, or I wake up in the morning feeling, uh, I don't feel like it today. It's not possible. Because all my children fast on Mondays and Thursdays. So I feel guilty if I don't fast. You've created that environment, that nafsiyah, that inclination towards doing something. It's very, very important we build this amongst our children, that nafsiyah at a very, very young age. Fourth point, quality of time that we need to spend with our children. You know what happens? It happened to me. I was at home and my son was talking to me and what did I do? What do you do? You start looking at your mobile phone. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. I uh, yeah. So I'm she yeah. Khalas. I'm mumkin. And he knows I'm not listening to him. And, and, and my son said to me, he said, Baba, you are munafiq. <laughs> he said you're a hypocrite. You said you want to communicate with us and you're communicating with a mobile phone. He said, What did I say to you? Uh you were talking about family. Yes, I know, but what did I exactly say? Uh, and, uh, and he caught me red-handed. It's, it's not the quantity of time. You could sit in front of your child for two hours, playing with him, looking at your mobile phone. It's the quality of time that you give. Quality of time. It may be 10 minutes, but that quality that you give to your child, that focus, that attention, is far more valuable than two hours and you're ignoring your son. We need to give quality of time to our children. And that goes back to the subject of the communication. How was your day today? What did you get up to? Do you have any problems, any issues? Anything I can help you with? Bob, I want to do so, so can I help you with this? Quality of time is very, very important. Not the quantity. Great if we can have quantity, but we live in a world today where time is not very easy to find. But the quality of time is very, very important. It was narrated that Fatima the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she said, when I spent time with my father, it's as if I was the only one, I was the only one my father thought about. And subhanAllah, she's talking about her father who had to think about the entire world, who had to deliver a message, who had to deliver a message. And he went on expeditions, he went on journeys. But she said that the time that I spent with my father is as if I was the only one. 
It's very important we give this quality of time. Two things, inshallah, before we, we start. Number one, we have to make Islam interesting. We have a huge challenge upon our hands. That if you have to choose between the Xbox, PlayStation 4, whatever you have, all these kind of games, and Islam, it's like you give a choice to our, our children, which one do you want? Do you want, do you want to pray or do you want to do this? You, you know our kids will go towards that which is a bit more enjoyable for them, what they consider to be enjoyable. We have to articulate and find ways or activities that can make Islam interesting. And I think we've had this discussion before in a different match about what are the kind of techniques, what are the kind of activities we can undertake to make Islam interesting. Yeah. And this is a huge area that we need to think about, how we can do that. You know, the example I gave you, the example that uh, I know a brother did, and I mentioned that before, I mentioned it again, that every single week he would organize a mini conference in his house. Yeah, and, in, and he would have his children and he would give each one a topic. Abdullah, today, inshallah, you're going to talk about salah, the importance of prayer. You know, Fatima, today, inshallah, you're going to talk about, you know, the role of, um, the role of Fatima, the, the, the daughter of Rasulullah and uh, Abdul Majid, inshallah, today you're going to talk about the importance of Hajj. And, and every single week they would have subjects. And then they would arrange a camera just like this. And they bring a chair. And then the father would stand next to, next to Abdul Taj, come and say, okay, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we have been honored by a guest who has come all the way from his bedroom upstairs, Sheikh Abdullah, who inshallah today will talk about the importance of prayer. And there's, uh, there's Mashallah Abdul, who's only six years old, like doing this. Uh, Bismillah, Rahman Rahim. But the point is, you're, you're creating that interest. And every single week they would do this, every single week. And now they've got a collection of, 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 of all those videos. And they look back, you know, five years on, they look back and look, Abdul, this is what you used to do. So you create that interest. And you can, you can just need to think creatively. We need to think creatively as parents. How do we generate that interest for Islam? For our children and how do we do that as a community in terms of the activities that we do the final part inshallah um, is a reality check we can do all of these things we can put all of that commitment we can do everything right we've got a checklist i've done all of these things but we have to recognize one thing there is no guarantee Doesn't matter what effort you put in, there's no guarantee. Our responsibility is our effort. Because on Yom Qiyamah, Allah will ask us, not about the result, because the result is not in our hands. Yeah, the result is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we're responsible for is our efforts. And that's what Allah will ask us about. Did we put the effort, the right effort for our children to provide the right environment, to provide them with the right culture, to give them the right values, to give them the right atmosphere. And we do the right to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala naturally that our children grow, that they become a source of love and support for us as parents. And they become a source of love and support for our ummah. But that it only arises from the effort that we put in. But there's no guarantee with all of that effort that the output will be the right output. Inshallah it is the case, but we, we can never be sure about it. But what we recognize is the effort that we put in. Inshallah, on that note, I just want to end, Inshallah, with uh, just one or two comments, uh, which is, please don't under, and underestimate the importance of the time that we need to give to our children. The struggle today is a huge struggle. We should not ridicule it. It's a huge struggle of the amount of time that we need to give to our children. And we need to find that time. We need to find that quality of time. We need to be thinking constantly how we can improve that relationship with our children to make this Islamic culture grow. How can we do that as parents? How can I do that by meeting other parents and, and building that relationship so as a community we can provide these facilities? It's imperative we have that kind of mentality before it's too late. Because at the end of the day, the only thing we leave behind our children, truly the wealth of any nation will be its culture. Money comes, money goes. Money comes, money it will go. And when we're six foot under, under, under the soil, that money will not help us. All that will help us is the effort that we put in to build this Islam and to build that Islam within our children. 
So I really hope, inshallah, that this is just an overview and insight to some of the things we can consider. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to give us that recognition of this responsibility and allow us to be successful in our attempts as parents, at least, to provide the right education, the right framework for our children.